Welcome to the Dialogue Book Report, where we talk about literature of interest to LDS readers. I'm Andrew Hall, an editor at Dialogue at Journal of Mormon Thought, coming to you from Fukuoka, Japan. And today I'm joined by three authors whose short stories have appeared in the new book, The Path and the Gate, Mormon Short Fiction, edited by myself and Robert Riley, and published at, by Signature Press. And the authors are Annette Haas, the author of Planting Iris, Joe Plicka, the author of Natural Causes, and Ryan Shoemaker, the author of Barry Dudson, The God Journals. So let's start by having you both, give, having you all give a brief introduction of your stories and a short reading from your story. Annette, could you start us off? Sure. Um, I love the prompt, and uh, I live in the avenues, and I spend a fair amount of time visiting relatives in the Salt Lake Cemetery. So I have the setting right in my head. But um, then I also had this character, Iris, who I allowed to say and do all the things I was never brave enough to say and do myself. So I had a lot of fun writing this story. Do you want me to go ahead and read? Sure. Okay. Iris waited for some pronouncement, something monumental to cause the leaves to quake, the headstones to tremble. But Brother Bushka just stood with the suggestion of a smile on his face. A soft thought invaded Iris's head. None of this matters. Ambition, being right, being wrong, male, female, affluence, poverty, up, down. It was all just dust in the wind. What did matter? Iris didn't know, but she got the feeling that the world was a more hospitable place than she had previously thought. One thing was certain, Wellard Kimball was no longer on her list of wrongs that needed to be righted. She turned toward Will. He shrugged, it's okay, you're forgiven. Then he strode back up the hill and placed a translucent hand on his sobbing wife's shoulder. Iris glanced at Brother Bushka and mouthed, thanks. He smiled, you're welcome, and nodded toward the rose-colored granite stone at the bottom of the hill. How could she miss the younger version of Harris leaning against the marker? He gave her a sly smile and stretched out his hand. I'm waiting for you, he called. I'm sorry about that car. She took a few steps and shook out her skirt. What car? That silver Mercedes that hit you on South Temple and East Street. You weren't paying attention. Then magically he was by her side, holding her tightly against his chest. I've missed you, he whispered into her mass of white hair. You need to be more careful. Why? Can a person die twice? And he laughed that adorable, charming laugh she loved. She pushed her nose into the chest hair above his scrubs neck and smelled his cologne, something she had done at least a million times. Leaning against their rose-colored marker, they sat on the grass, laughing and talking like a couple of kids, falling in love, until the sun sank in a glorious display of hot pink and orange. Harris grasped her hand. Time to go. She blinked a couple of times. Where? Birds migrate at night, using the stars to navigate, he said. So well. Thank you. Uh <laughs> Well, maybe what we should do, uh, let's, let's go ahead and just talk about maybe each story. Since this is reading, we'll go ahead and, and ask questions of that. Um, I didn't plan this, but the three of you, all all the stories kind of have this eternal, you know, the, the, the prompt was talk about the path and the gate and these these these, uh, these faith, baptism, repentance, faith, repentance, baptism, the gift of the Holy Ghost, and then the the... the Enduring to the end, and all three of you kind of had a lot of the enduring to the end, at least somewhere in the story. Uh, Joe's at the very kind of at the very end. Ryan's the whole thing was in, was was post post life, and and Annette, a lot of yours was in post, you know, the, in the, the next life. Yeah. So that was a yeah. connection with with, with all. <laughs> yeah, your last your scene last there was was it was the couple being reunited after death. Yeah, um, Joe, do you have any questions for for Annette? Um, yes, I, so thinking about this, um, and Ryan and I, 
we go way back. We've had so we've had a few side conversations about this as well. Just uh, you know, I know that um, I love the like I love how you framed it as kind of a fantasy, right? Because isn't that probably what so many women in the church maybe have imagined, right? Like this, what would it look like? If, if women were really allowed to just stand up and speak their mind, not that they're not allowed, right? But this is the centering of a female voice, the questioning of male privilege. I mean, that word is even in the story. Um, but yeah. I wanted to ask you oh, something that's a little more a little more crafty and technical, um, which is, I don't know. I'm I've been thinking a lot. I've I've been listening to a lot of podcasts or uh, YouTube videos about near death experiences. Um, and I wondered what what informed your depiction of the afterlife in this story, if anything, or if it was just just seemed right, or th- this idea that she's there, she doesn't know that she's dead, she doesn't know that where she is at first. Well, I I don't think of the straight and narrow way, perhaps the way other people do. I um I think there's probably going to be a lot of variability. Uh, things will probably not be as we imagine. And um, I have a real problem with infallibility and um, people decreeing things that perhaps are unknown. And and so yeah, I think that's that's always been kind of an issue for me. And and it's very hard. It's very hard to be. Um, a woman and have men who are not particularly intelligent speak down to you. <laughs> I really hope that's not happening right now. <laughs> you know, not not being included in choices that affect you dramatically. So, yeah, I think there are some real problems with sexism, not just in our religion, but in all religion. And uh, it, it's really problematic. And Unfortunately, things are slowly starting to change. So I think that's very positive. Yeah, I, I just loved the just the humor of everything in the afterlife. I think we we imagine that we get it up there. There's a line. There's a guy with a notebook, yeah. uh, handing orientation <laughs> packets. Right when in fact, I, you know, it seems a little more like it might just be a little bit of chaos, like chaos. Like yeah. she didn't know she was dead. Yeah. But real quickly, just on the heels of that, did you plan from the beginning to have Willard die in the story, or was that something that just kind of happened as you wrote? Oh, well, well, Kimball was such a problem for poor Iris, and uh, I don't know, it just evolved. I mean, some of the some of the things in the story, of course, are prompted by true events. The Temple Recommend interview, my husband and I still laugh about that. It absolutely did happen. I didn't embellish what the man said. How can you improve upon how you fondled each other's bodies? I mean, that's just, we still think that's very funny. So a lot of things are sort of um, motivated by things that are real and things, you know, you kind of extrapolate and extend uh, things that have happened in your own life. I think that's pretty common when we're writing. But of course, then I've embellished a lot. So and I've always I've always wanted to raise my hand when they asked for the pussy. But never had. You know, I remember hearing somewhere, and this was kind of revelatory for me. I don't remember where I heard it, but somebody basically said, you know, the most of the time the church is a really great place if you're a white man yeah i remember you know thinking about that and and you know thinking of my own experience as a you know as a white man like there's you go to church and there's this priesthood and there's so much validation and all of these you know events and um and i and i think as i thought about it more there's you know, I think sometimes men in the church, there's just a certain blindness to female experience. I don't think it's just in our church. I think uh, I think it's widespread. I, I don't think we need to feel guilty in particular because we're part of a much larger pattern. And uh, yeah, it's, it's 
it's terribly unfortunate. So do you uh, do you see President Bushka? And by the way, I don't know where that name came from, but if I had a child, Bushka would be the name Bernard Bushka. But but do you see him as uh, um, kind of a, kind of an exploration of a, a new type of yes male in the yes. church? And and you said something earlier, Abby, just almost kind of heartbreaking, where. This story is a way for you to say the things that you wish you you could have said. <laughs> yeah, could say. So, do you see President Bushka as um, as as kind of a a standard that more men should should aim for? And what would and what would that look like <laughs> to to you? I really enjoyed, and he's a total creation. He wasn't really based on anybody. Although I have to say, when I when I'm writing and I can't think of the name, I grab the war directory and there's a man named Bushka in our building. And I haven't approached him yet about borrowing his name. I probably should. But um, yes, I felt like uh, that character was much more open and perhaps more in tune spiritually and less motivated by ambition, which I think is a real problem. Um ambition and deferential treatment and uh you know it's it's hard women are not motivated in the same way to our church assignments that men are i i really believe that to be true does that answer your question it does and that, and that's what i thought too i thought i'm gonna write i'm gonna write down what brother bushka is like <laughs> that's how i'm gonna that's how I'm going to be. Yeah, I love when he shows up, you know, because for him, there's no division. You know, he he shows up at the, the the Cub Scouts meeting and, you know, there's there isn't a female calling, a male calling. And, um, you know, he's just willing to serve and to connect with people in a way that. Um, yeah. That, and, you know, he was, and he yeah. was called by a general authority with dementia. Which is hilarious. Right. And I, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, some cognitive impairment there for but like president bush to get his yeah i i cannot get enough of the irony the the wonderful irony of this this general authority making these wonderful bold callings you know like really beating the bushes and finding new and interesting people to fulfill these roles but then it's all erased because he had him it was something wrong with his brain that was making him it, no, I, I really did have a fun time writing this story. I just, I love the prompt. I, it all just kind of came together. It was a lot of fun. It was, a, it's a very, I, it's very funny. I just, I ask? go, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Right. Okay. So what, yeah, I, I, if I could just ask, yeah, another question. So I, you know, I love the, you know, I'm always teaching my student, my creative writing students, you know, like those, look for those titles that are kind of double entendres and, and have multiple meanings and, you know, planting iris. Um, so I feel that there are some layers of meaning there. So I just wanted to ask you, how, how did you find that title? What is it? What does it mean to you? Well, um, I have to say that part of the story was edited out that uh, involved, you know, planting some bulbs. Her kids come to her gravesite and are going to plant some iris bulbs. And so that kind of got taken away. But I really did like the name Iris. So, yeah. Well, there's something about, yeah, the, the planting, you know, that. Um, sure. It, yeah, it, she's, it, about, she's about to be planted, planted you know? in the earth. <laughs> but yet in, in death, um, you know, you know, I love it. I think this is what the path in the gate is about, right? That we're. You know, you don't go through the gate and it's just over, you know, even in death, there's so much to learn. And I think even in death, like there's that planting, you know, that that she learns that um, all those things that that kind of preoccupied you, they they just didn't matter. You know, like her roots, even in death, are going deeper. Yeah. Yep. And the last line I borrowed from a. Uh, a Dark Night Skies presentation in Capitol Reef. That's actually true. 
birds do migrate at night using stars to navigate. So, wow. kind of fun. That's super cool. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Uh, we can do this conversation, but let's go. Let's keep going with the readings. So, Joe, can you tell us about natural causes? Sure. Um, so it just kind of started off as a joke in my head that was, <laughs> "What if?" Because I live in a small town. Um, what if a bishop? What if a leader was going through the drive-through at McDonald's and ordered a coffee, and there was someone he knew, like one of his youth in the ward that was serving him. Um, in Ohio, where I went to school, they actually have drive through like liquor stores. Like you can drive through and get a case of beer and stuff. Um, but I was, but I decided to keep it a little more PG uh, and just make it coffee. And then it just kind of evolved from there. Um, it's, you know, I think Annette had mentioned earlier something um, to me in another conversation about this being a fork in the road. And I think that's one way of looking at the story is, yeah, it's this idea, I think a little bit of a tongue in cheek look at an, the idea that, you know, the, these little decisions that we make could have big effects, something that we talk a lot about in the church. So um, I will just read a very brief excerpt of dialogue that is for me, maybe was the funnest part of the story to write. Um, just because I myself, I don't think have ever ordered coffee in a drive through And I was trying to imagine like how disoriented and kind of silly I would sound not knowing. I actually asked some of my friends, uh, you know, non LDS friends, like, what do you say when you go through the drive through Like, what's the lingo? Um, so this is Barry, uh, sorry, not Barry, that's Brian's, Ryan's character. This is Glenn ordering coffee at McDonald's. Um, <clears throat> he rolled forward and smiled at the battered drive through speaker as a muffled teenage voice buzzed out. Welcome to McDonald's. May I take your order? Yes, I'll have an Egg McMuffin and a... Anything else, sir? Yes. A coffee. A regular coffee. I think so. You think so? What are my options? Um, lots. There was an edge of irritation in the voice. Glenn found he couldn't open his mouth. Sir, still nothing from Glenn. Sir, we have frappes, lattes, mocha, cappuccino, and regular coffee, hot or large. Glenn burst out, his tongue loosed. Sorry, he said in a softer voice. Large, please. A large what, sir? Oh, gosh. Glenn gripped the steering wheel with both hands. A large, regular coffee, please. Hot. Okay, the voice said with renewed calm. It seemed to be gearing up for something. How would you like your coffee? The morning sun blazed through the windshield. Tiny beads of sweat sprouted on Glenn's scalp. You mean, like, in a cup? <laughs> Sir, have you ever... The drive through speaker clicked and the voice disappeared. Then the speaker clicked on again. I'm sorry, sir. We got your order. Please just pull up to the first window. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> I well, oh, Brian, do you have any questions or, or comments about it? Well, uh, so Joe well, last week just gave uh, a fab fabulous devotional at BYU Hawaii. And anyone listening to this, go listen to it, um, read the transcripts. But Joe, you talked about, you know, how we we should get away from these kind of either or scenarios in our lives and in the gospel um, and embrace the power of, of and. Um, so I was wondering if you could just kind of distill down quickly what, what you were trying to communicate uh, in your devotional. And maybe how you see uh, some of those ideas playing out in your story. So, um, thanks. Yeah, I definitely, uh, you know, I've been thinking about this in various ways for a while. And, and you know, the, the idea of paradox and, and this idea of proving contraries, uh, which Joseph Smith supposedly said, but then I was reading some more about it. And that may not mean what we think it means. But anyways, that's a conversation for another time. Um 
Jared Halverson uh, at BYU Provo talks about this in the context of proving polarities. Um, Terrell Givens has talked about paradox a lot within LDS culture, but the idea just that we we so often want certainty and we want it badly, and sometimes it takes a negative form. Like we we're certain that we are uh, not worthy, right? And and we ignore all the reasons why we are, or vice versa. Um, so Glenn, I think he's just a you know a, a a character who's lived his whole life, you know, seeing himself in in a certain way and um, seeing the world in a certain way, and uh, he he kind of he knows that that that's not the only way of of seeing things. So um, in the end, I guess to you know to, to to briefly put it, he's learning that he can be two things at once. Um, he can be both a bishop and uh, someone who makes bad decisions. He can be somebody who's both on the path and off the path at the same time, um, or at least somebody who's on the path to God, but maybe off the path that he uh, thought that he was going to follow to get there, or the path that that he that other people think he should be on. So, anyways, it was a uh, I really love the choice you made and how it worked. I I have a friend who started a drinking tea for breakfast every morning, and it's it's like a declaration of independence. I mean, it's tea. <laughs> it's like, what? <laughs> and uh, I think we attach so much to significance to things that are not significant. I mean... When did food choices become more important than how we treat other people? You know, I, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, it becomes a marker of identity, you know, and and yeah. kind of this idea that yeah. we are proving ourselves, we're proving our obedience by being doing everything according to the last letter of the law. And, and that's a, a very happy way to live for many people. But I think other people uh, find themselves getting exhausted and kind of confused when they start to uh, see that not everything in their life always goes perfectly according to plan, even when they're doing everything that they possibly can. Well, and that's, a, and that's a repudiation. If things don't go perfectly, it must be because you took the wrong fork in the road. Yeah. You know? I mean, if you were doing everything perfectly, then your life would line up perfectly, which, you know, is so far from the truth. And the and the irony, I think, is that you know this, at least the story hints at or kind of offers the possibility. Although I I don't think it has to be read this way, that this little choice did in fact oh, lead I don't. <laughs> to this faraway place that you know his parents in particular and others may have may think is that is so sad that you ended up there. Um, I love this. Let his hair grow so I have this long white hair at the end. Right. Well, and I think for him, you know, and I think the idea is kind of at the end that that's where, you know, he's closer to God and maybe hearing God more than he ever has before. Um, but, you know, it's we get we get so scared of these little choices that we make. And I, you know, I remember hearing a, a talk in conference years ago, you know, again, well intentioned, probably worked really well for a lot of people where. The speaker said, you know, my my family a couple generations ago went on a drive on Sunday during Sunday school instead of going to Sunday school. And that was the moment that everything unraveled. Right. And so we have this idea that if we somehow step off the path for just a single moment, you know, we're going to Satan's going to grab us and pull us down. And, and that's going to be the end of it right there. And um, and it's well, well, yeah. the whole thought that religion is transactional or that our life choices are so transactional and uh, uh, we determine things that of course we can't determine and I thought that was really wonderful that you had that choice lead to his wife's cancer <laughs> it's just oh no <laughs> right yeah. we try to control I things there are a lot of people who really feel that way you know and and are so hard on themselves so needlessly. Yeah. If only I had done this or that. Yeah. Sure. Sure. Yeah. You know, with with Glenn, I've thought a lot about 
like the idea of the straight and narrow path. And straight to me means a direction, right? That we're we're trying to progress forward. Um, we're learning things. But the narrow, but you know, the narrow is a little more tricky. Um, and I, I think I'm starting to see the narrow as, right, to get in, right, you need to, there's the repentance, there's, you know, the baptism. But I think once we get on that path, like I want to think of it as, as very, very wide, um, lots of different options, you know, and that from your story, I think Will uh, has a very narrow understanding of the, the, the path. And I think sometimes we subscribe to that and, and we feel this pressure, right, that this is the way that you need to be LDS and, 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 and this is how you need to, you know, do your callings and you need to be so immersed. Um, you know, I think with Glenn, you know, it's almost like that. I told you this, Joe, it's like that, that a coffee is almost like the fruit that, that forbidden fruit that when he partakes of it, um, you know, I think he sees that the, the, the path is way is a lot more expansive. And I think after his, his wife passes away, he sees a different path. You know, I could, I could remarry and I can be a state president. I can be a, a mission president, or I can marry this woman who loves me deeply, though she's not of my faith. And, you know, maybe some of my kids are going to choose, choose another path. Um, but the path is so much more expansive. And even then, like in the end, Joe, I love how uh, Glenn's out in the garden. And even though his hair is long and he's chosen this different path, he hears God speaking to him. And his his maybe his his uh his parents aren't happy about his his choice of marriage, but right, with within the path, it's wide and we can still find God and and hear his voice. I think it's just very important that we somehow get away from religion as an insurance policy. Uh, my best friend's first little baby was hydrocephalic and died when, when he was just six months old. And she had lived just an exemplary life, and so had her husband. And, and this was not part of the script, and it was so devastating. And I thought so many times, oh, just the pain that was inflicted by this rigidity was was harmful, you know, and uh, and you start to view things very differently. Yeah. Well, and, and Joe, I love I love this idea of paradox, and I will tell you right now, like it's, I think it's been illuminating, and I think I'm having a bit of a paradigm shift. Um, you know, as I, as I see my faith travels and, you know, how I, how I view the world, because, you know, I think the paradox of our faith is that we are saints and we are sinners. And it seems to me that, uh, Glenn is kind of denying that, that part of himself that he's a sinner and we sin at times. And, it, you know, in a way, you know, I think he's, he's tried to be a saint and, and I see it, there, there's part of him that's kind of left the garden, but then there's this part of him that still is in the garden, right? That um, is trying to stay out of that fallen world and is, um, is, is isolated. And I think the coffee, in a way, it, it's, you know. It saves him. Well, yeah, it, it connects him. You know, that's the, yeah, that's the message of the story. We all need to drink co more coffee. Yeah. 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 Well, but well, you know, and the, go ahead. Oh no, no, you go go ahead in that. The wonderful Mark character, I I love that character. I thought that was so much fun that he ended up where he ended up because he was so rigid, you know, and he didn't realize how wide that path is, and so he couldn't negotiate. Go ahead. What were you going to say? Um, no, that yeah, that's a that's a great comment. And um, you know, I think something else that you're exploring, Joe, is just the the isolation that our leaders feel at times. And I think with Glenn, it's the isolation that he's imposed upon himself by 
by maybe avoiding sin where he feels so disconnected from those he serves. He's almost like helping people through the the the, the repentance process, but like in a in a generalized way. And there's something about um, that coffee that connects him to people, that connects him to um, Julie. Like that's so beautiful. Where um, you know after you know she she serves him that coffee, and he remembers when she's 12 years old, and it's like they they have this this bond after that. But I think something else that you explore so beautifully that we don't talk about much in the in in the church is just the isolation that our our leaders feel. I have a friend who's a state president, and um, we we've been texting back and forth, and I and I said, hey, how's how's your life as the state president? And he wrote back and he said, you know, sometimes I I just wish I could have a moment where I don't have any obligations and I can just sit and think. And I thought, oh, that that's so difficult. And I feel Glenn's kind of experience in this isolation and he can't even talk to his parents about it. Like he can't have this conversation with them, you know, that I, you know, I, I feel disconnected. Can I connect with you? Um, I feel bad for our, our leaders sometimes. It's hard to imagine a worse fate uh, for me than, you know, being called to a high calling in the church. Just the, the like you said, the the monopoly on your time, but also like, yeah, the, the complete elevation and disconnection from things. Um, I, yeah, I think you nailed it with Glenn. I don't see him as someone who wants to try new things, you know, that he's a hedonist and seeking pleasure because he's, I think he's, he just wants connection, you know, like when, when Adam and Eve fell to use the fall analogy, they were maybe closer to God or more like God at that point than they ever were. Right. And so he, he wants to experience this thing uh, that billions of other people experience just to connect, just to connect with, with something else outside of him and outside of his own experience. And yeah. I, I don't like that he, he he wore out being bishop. You know, at the end of four years, he'd kind of had it enough. And I think uh, I think that's probably more typical than we like to think or, or people admit. It's hard. Yeah. Yeah, I, I remember my dad as state president, you know, and he would he'd go to church and he'd have to sit on the stand and always have something inspiring to say and he'd He'd walk into Sunday school and people were suddenly a little more buttoned up. And and um, I think he just wanted genuine connection. And I just remember feeling so, so sad because he was this friendly guy and and but felt disconnected from the people he was like serving and and loving. Oh. Yeah. Well, Ryan, let's 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 talk about your story. These Stories in this collection have people at various moments in their life journey. Yours is at the ultimate far end of the stream that I've read uh, yeah. of these kind of, of this. Barry does in the God journals. Can you tell us? Yeah. Yeah. I, I like to think, you know, way out in the, in the future. And, you know, yeah, I just wanted to think about, um, you know, kind of the afterlife and, you know, and as, as I said, I think we're all exploring this, this idea of, um, you know, maybe there isn't just one gate we go through. You know, maybe in our progression we go through all kinds of of gates and and um, you know, I remember on my mission in Italy and you know, we would get the Jehovah's Witnesses magazines and there was always on the cover there was, you know, families in heaven and they were there were panda bears and big watermelons and they were play volleyball. And I thought, you know, that that sounds fun for a while. And even in our theology, you know, it seems like to, to become a god and a goddess and to create worlds, like, uh, you know, that that seems all right. But this idea of perfection, like, I think as writers, you know, we 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 like chaos. You know, we take the chaos of language and we tame it and we we create something. And um, I can't imagine a world where there is perfection and. And maybe we're not grappling with these things. So I wrote a story where there is chaos. Um, uh, there's still lots of learning to do. So let me give you some context. So uh, Barry, you know, in his life struggled with with obesity and was bullied and and marginalized. And so it comes time to create 
a world and he creates a world without opposition and everyone is is beautiful and and slim and I don't, there's not even defecation, right? Defecation. <laughs> or menstruation. <laughs> menstruation, right? There's, you know, I guess you don't want somebody's defecating in, in this world because it's, it smells like cinnamon rolls. Wouldn't that be nice? Uh, so, you know, what happens, is, right? This world without opposition, right? His, his children thrive so much that they create technologies and they just abandon the world and take out, take, uh, go into the universe and, and so he's at what he's just looking down on this this empty world. So here's Barry Dutson sitting on some you know nebula somewhere, and these are his thoughts as he looks down on that empty world. <clears throat> on Earth, always prayed, always asked the deep questions that bothered me. Would ask God, why are you so mean? All those people who died in the flood, even the children the slaughter of the Canaanites, the execution of those poor Israelites for just looking at a golden calf? Why? Did it really happen? Was it just creative license? A bunch of bored medieval monks craving some adventure? Please tell me it was just that. And me, why are you so silent when I cry out at night? Would I want you to take away the hurt and the embarrassment? Why don't you stop it? But never an answer. While at Celestial Kingdom University, finally did send God a letter telling him everything. I've never told Viv this. Hope God would finally reveal the secret of human suffering and why his great silence. His response, Dear Barry, I appreciate your letter. I know this won't satisfy you, but I can't answer your questions. The universe won't let me. I know you're angry. I know you felt alone. All I can say is that the journey continues far beyond here. And someday you'll find the answers with understanding and affection, God. And I didn't understand, not at Celestial Kingdom University, not as Viv and I created spirit children, not as I summoned the world into existence. Through all of it, held tightly to that kernel of resentment for God, always thinking, I'll be the cool God, the hugging God, the shoulder to cry on God, the lean on me God. And now staring down at an empty earth, maybe I understand a little more. Maybe the cool God, the hugging God, just ends up as the God of a deserted world. And that other, oh, oh, go ahead, Joe. No, no, no. Okay. <laughs> I, there are no utopias. Uh, I really loved, I have actually this whole last part that you just read written there it's such an intriguing thought and uh of course the journey is going to continue somehow i think so it, it will be interesting to see you know as i get older this becomes a little more realistic hey i can feel it too yeah. i feel it in my lower back for some reason <laughs> <laughs> The, the central concern here in this story, the thing I love about it, Ryan, is that it's unbelievably funny. Of course, like, you know, if I, I, I don't know if this is hyperbolic, but, you know, we, we, we need more, I think, absurdity, humor, parody in our tradition, you know, and I think Ryan is, he's out there. I mean, who else is doing it? Right. Um, and, uh, but then there's this, of course, like any good story, it ends up at somewhere that feels uh, authentically, you know, it, there are authentic emotions and, and ideas, feelings there to mull around as well. And so at the core of all this is this idea that, like you just read, what is a world without a suffering? Is it is it possible? What would it look like? What, what would it mean? Um, and it's the great question that people have been asking forever is, you know, if God's loving, if he is good, then why is the world often so bad? And why do people suffer and children and innocent people, especially? So I guess my, my little question, it's probably not a very good question. It's a trick question, I guess. But in this story, were you, uh, do, do you think you were, do you see it more as an attempt to tentatively answer this question um, or an attempt to defer answers to this question? Uh, or both. 
Yeah, I almost, I mean, if anything, you know, it, it's, it's a philosophical question, but it's maybe something that can only be answered experientially, right? That we, you know, we learn and we, we suffer. I mean, really the idea, kind of the kernel from that, as I thought about suffering, I, it, I was watching an Ing- Ingmar Bergman film, Joe, you know, I love, um, uh, winter light and it's, you know, it's this, uh, Swedish priest who has, you know, lost his faith and he thinks um, God is he, the spider. He, he sees God as this, you know, this spider who just kind of looks down on us and and on our, our suffering. You know, I think if anything, I'm just trying to reframe suffering. I uh, remember years ago, I wrote a story for for dialogue about, uh, you know, this, this LDS, you know, returned missionary who has a little white whiteboard and he he writes down all of the, the attributes he's looking for in uh, this perfect woman that he wants to marry and in the end he ends up well, having a relationship with a woman with a prosthetic le- uh, leg and kind of his realization in the end is all things are are beautiful and as I finished up the Barry Dutson story I was surprised that was that's kind of the ending like he he kind of accepts this the suffering. Um, he's uh, he he embraces chaos, and he sees something beautiful in it. Like he embraces his 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 old body, right? His unwieldy body and and Viv's body, and he sees beauty in in suffering. And and for me, it kind of goes back to um, Viktor Frankl. You know, it says that you know suffering ceases to, to become suffering the moment it finds meaning. And I think this whole journey is for Barry as that that suffering, finding the meaning in it and seeing that a, a world without suffering is a wor- world really without beauty, I think. A different type of beauty. Did it play into your thought that um, suffering is what's required for us to experience empathy? I wondered if that's where you were trying to go. I th- I think so. Yeah, I, I think that without the the suffering, there's um, no empathy, and I, and I think that's why I, I created a character who kind of suffered um, with his weight, which is ironic, you know, because he he has suffered so much. But I guess the lesson he has to learn, right, that that progression is that suffering was for his his benefit. And in a way, it's 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 a gift we we give our children. And that's like as as a parent. Right. I've I felt that so many times, you know, trying to limit my children's suffering and and maybe at times that, that that helicopter parent. But it's it's hard to see them suffer, but it's essential and it it creates empathy within them. Yeah, I, I love the way you absolutely stretched way past Mormon theology. I mean, I, I, I mean, it was funny, but it was also really, really wonderful, too. You know, I liked it. Yeah, well, I stretched it so far, I might be starting my own church here soon. It, <laughs> be a, a cult of adoration. For, I don't know. I don't, there was a time when, you know, speculating and kind of creating maybe even a little bit, theologically speaking, was kind of a well-respected activity within our tradition, but we oh, yeah. kind of shut that down. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, but it is interesting to think about, you know, the, we just don't know the particulars, you know, someday I want to believe that we're going to be these gods and goddesses. And I love that idea that God, and you know, was once like us and but when you try to think about it, like I, you know, as I, you know, Barry, you know, creating these worlds and he's like, you know, I just kind of put my hands in the air and said these words. And, you know, it's it's hard to imagine that life. And the, o- the only way I can imagine it is kind of, and that what you said earlier is it, it's maybe it's going to be so different from what we imagine. You know, maybe we're going to see God and he's going to have on a plaid shirt and a Metallica Teacher. Like, wouldn't wouldn't that be wouldn't that be awesome? You know, and and is that responsibility something you really aspire to? 
you know, as a god. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, but I like the idea, you know, it's, I think it would be a lot of responsibility, but once again, I like this idea that we, we just don't go through the gate and that's end. Like, I love the idea that the path continues that, um, you know, as, as kids, we think God is perfect and, you know, maybe, maybe our, you know, our heavenly parents know everything, but I like the idea that, um, maybe we might not know everything. Maybe we will continue and in some way we will make mistakes and, um, you know, just as writers, you know, we're we're always refining our craft. Maybe as gods and goddesses, we will eternally be refining whatever we're going to do and learning from it. I I hope it's a great vision that this this I mean, we God is this is this perfect, almost personalityless um, being to us. But here we see, you know, if 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 God, you know is like if came from a human type being then they had a personality you know they had some kind of you know weaknesses and and quirks and things like that and so it was fun to see barry as a god but you know we see his personality we see his quirks we see his his pain from his past so it's it's it changes the way i kind of think about god you know sure everyone comes from some somewhere yeah and and i wish we had the toe tapping um prophets that that brought all their message with uh <laughs> with music like like he created yeah so i hope we can make the world over in all the things that we love in in this in this life yeah imagining general conference as a broadway show every six months <laughs> yeah. everything i would be there <laughs> well let, let me ask all you about um what you what, what else is coming for you in the future uh, and then was, I didn't really introduce you, um, so I'll do that a little bit too. So Annette is the author of three novels, most recently Maggie's Place, um, and several short stories, including some have been published in Dialogue. Um, so what's coming up for you next? I'm just getting older by the minute. <laughs> no, I'm I'm working on a manuscript. I'm I'm always working on something, so it's fun. Here. Yeah, I like writing. Morning sitting at the computer are happy mornings for me. Good. And you mentioned offline. So you you started writing uh, after you retired. Is that right? Or how did that work? Did yes. Uh-huh. You were yeah. I was a high school teacher. Was a debate coach. Yeah. Well, great. I love your writing. Uh, so, well, did you give me a, a hint of what what what's coming? What the next manuscript is you're working on? Or do you want to oh, I, I I talked about that a little earlier. Yeah, it's uh, it's about why the good men don't run for office. You know the terrible scrutiny that we um, focus in on people who want to be public servants. Or I, I don't know. It's complicated. I think why men run for office. I think why women run for office. I think is is really complicated and and also very interesting. So a political story set in Utah? Is that right? Uh-huh. Okay. All right. <laughs> You're excited. Juicy. So Joe Plicka teaches at BYU Hawaii and he's got poems, stories, and essays that are found in all kinds of uh, literary journals and, and in the LDS anthology Fire in the Pasture, 21st Century Mormon Poets. Uh, I know you mostly from your from your personal essays and your creative nonfiction. Have you have you done fiction before, Joe? Well, it's a little bit funny and almost embarrassing to say that's that's actually where I, you know, my dissertation at Ohio was a, a collection of short fiction. Um, and then I just kind of started writing essays. Like once I had a moment, I got situated here at BYU Hawaii. Um, I was kind of electrified the first time I read uh, a Catholic author named Brian Doyle. Um, he has a little bit of a cult following among LDS writers. Uh, he's he actually has when he was here. He's passed away uh, in 2017, but he visited the BYU's uh, except for Hawaii. I think he wanted to come to Hawaii to complete the trifecta, as he called it, uh, but didn't didn't make it. Um, 
and uh, you know the this revelation of like being able to write um from a spiritual standpoint um as as because i never wanted to be an lds writer i i always kind of thought no that's i don't want to say any names you know because it's i thought that's that and that's not you know i i it's not complex it's not complicated it's not thoughtful of course that's very much not true um but i found that for me to be able to write about my faith um as myself was kind of freeing so yeah so i just i mean i that would if i were going to have anything put together a collection at some point in the near future it would probably be a collection of of essays creative nonfiction. but i'm still i still want to write fiction i still uh you know ryan is is mentoring me helping me regain my uh my fiction cred and i love feel so honored to be a part of this anthology and have my kind of dip my toe in the water and be alongside so many great names uh really amazing people like ryan and annette and ryan uh teaches at southern utah university and i i first got to know his stories at several in sunstone just just hilarious but and touching stories that, that got published there and he had a he has a collection beyond the lights that was published a couple years ago and you have a new short story collection coming out soon right what was that called uh that will be the tentatively the righteous road stories <laughs> okay so in a way yeah like maybe uh, maybe i've been thinking about this idea of um roads and, and paths you know it's a yeah it's a you know collection of uh mormon lit that i hope uh uh appeals to lds and non-lds uh audiences so right exploring the, this righteous road and what is it um and then what i'm working on now is i mean it sounds so strange to say but it's um I'm thinking like um, the things they carried, the Vietnam meets a group of Italian missionaries. So I'm I'm thinking of uh, just down the road a little bit, um, uh, uh, kind of connected stories about uh, missionaries in Italy, and maybe some of them speculative. But my biggest dream is I would like to collaborate with this wonderful fiction writer poet and essay essayist named Joe Plicka. <laughs> that is that is all my bucket list to collaborate to have uh, and just the the craziness that will ensue maybe something you know I'm thinking Joe maybe some a, a collection of short stories called Mormon or Mormon missionary anecdotes or something <laughs> mission apostasy we'll talk, we'll talk later <laughs> yeah well yeah the one thing that we did collaborate on uh, once upon a time that's out there, I didn't even put on my link tree because I was worried that um, it was too too irreverent. People would get the wrong idea, but it's out there. If you want to go searching on the internet, folks, you can <laughs> find it. Yes. It, don't put your employment in jeopardy, Joe, at this time. <laughs> why you're white. So, Ryan, why, why do you think you write so much about Mormons? You know, I... I think when I started kind of writing seriously, uh, you know, like every every other writer, you know, I was imitating and I think I was imitating uh, Raymond Carver and, you know, George Saunders. And yeah, I was just writing um, stories about non LDS people. And then I think one day I just thought I'm going to I'm going to write I'm going to write a, a piece of Mormon fiction and. Um, and I sent it out to. Uh, uh, it was published in, in Eriantum. I thought, well, it's it's landed. And then I thought, you know what? I'm going to send it to Santa Monica Review and tell them, hey, it's been published here. Will you publish it? And and it was published there. So I think it was kind of this um, this moment where, uh, uh, you know, uh, of epiphany where I realized, you know what? My culture is kind of boring to me or, you know, seemingly, but to, to somebody else, like, uh, you're part of a very interesting subculture, right? These these young people with these white shirts and ties, and you know this, you know. Um, so I think I write it to understand it better, to understand my experience. But I write it because, um, you know, I'm hoping there's a a Mormon or there's a there's a Mormon audience who wants it, and I hope there's a non-Mormon audience uh, who is interested in it. And I really 
think there there is. So that's that's why I write it and will continue. In fact, I couldn't even I think it'd be hard for me to write a non Mormon story. Ryan has a story that came out recently called Come As You Are, where a, a in in the nineties and a a teenage Mormon boy meets Kurt Cobain. Uh, <laughs> with a great story. It's, it's very yeah, e- even there, I couldn't help myself. I had to make those teenagers LDS. It just, it just had to happen. Well, is there any other comments anyone wants to make? Otherwise, oh, thank you. All right. Yeah, yeah we should probably this pro- probably uh, cut this off before you know, if people <laughs> haven't already tuned out. That I mean, after Annette, I think they were like, all right, we're done. <laughs> <laughs> Well, and, yeah, and like that, if I could just say thank you too, like, I mean, seriously, I, um, both of your stories, you know, I, I think we're, I'm at it, you know, the middle age, Joe, you're there too, kind of right where we, we kind of, um, you know, redefine ourselves and, you know, with our faith and, and you would think as we get older that we understand life a little better, but as I get older, I, life is more mysterious to me and more expensive. And I can't make any sense of it. And I really want, I just want to thank you for your stories, you know, for, um, you know, their beauty. And, and I think they came at the right time for me when I'm, I had some questions and, and I love what you're exploring. And I found some answers there. Um, you know, Chekhov said that, uh, you know, as, as fiction writers, we're, we're not, we're not in the business of answering questions. We, we just asked the question. So I, I appreciate so much the questions that you two are are answering. And Andrew, thank you so much, you and Robert, for yes. I think it's inspired. Yes. And uh, um, you know, I think people will look back and this, you've you captured a wonderful cultural moment uh for Mormon letters. Thank you. Yes. Well, thank you to everyone out there listening to the Dialogue Book Report. This show is part of the Dialogue Podcast Network a collective of independent podcasts that promote inquiry into all aspects of LDS, the LDS tradition, includes wonderful shows like Angels and Seer Stones, a Latter-day Saint folklore po- podcast, in which the folklorists Christine and Christopher Blight examine the lived religion of Latter-day Saints, the stories we tell, and the beliefs we debate. It's a great place for, for story ideas, I think. The show is produced and edited by Daniel Foster Smith, who also provides music. Our content manager is Emily Jensen, and to hear more, go to dialoguejournal.com. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. I'm Taylor Petrie, editor of Dialogue, a journal of Mormon thought. And this is Dialogue Out Loud. My eyelashes were subtly coated in matte black mascara. On my cheeks, a light dusting of dusty rose-colored blush powder. Just enough that I could feel comfortable and almost myself. On Tuesday, my visiting teacher said she knew I was really busy at work and brought over a casserole for dinner, the chief ingredient of which was zucchini. Maybe it isn't the Lamanite who needs to forsake the incorrect traditions of our forefathers. Maybe it's the belief of racial hierarchy that we need to forsake. Never learn to play the organ, the old woman told me. You might get a different calling from time to time. But make no mistake, once you get on the path of becoming a ward organist, that's what you'll be until you die. Each year, we bring you even more great fiction, personal essays, and poetry taken from the pages of our quarterly journal. We couldn't do this without your support. So thank you for reading, listening, and supporting Dialogue with your donations, subscriptions, or by simply leaving us a review wherever you get your podcasts. For more content like this, or to get involved with dialogue events, go to dialoguejournal.com. Dialogue Podcast Network.